So at the heart of Christ, we've had three parts. Today we're going to be looking at the fact that the heart of Christ is united with his people. There is a very definite aspect of solidarity that exists between Jesus and us. You know, we don't want to think of Jesus as our functional Savior who died back then, won salvation for us, but not think about him now. Because when we think about him now and we start to understand his heart presently as we sit here, we realize that there is this incredible unity, this overwhelming solidarity where he joins himself with us. And so when he said to his disciples, I am with you always, they could have had a little bit of what just went down because he said that and then ascended to heaven. Like, Whoa, <laughs> what did that mean? You know what it means? is like my heart is with you always. I'm with you in that way. I'm going to send the spirit, but, but no, my heart is always with you. So he co-suffers with us, he deals gently with us, he permanently embraces us, he sides with us, and he continues to work for us. Those are the points that I want to cover this morning, and I just want to take scripture and and a a couple of verses and just work through um, the the reality of Jesus' solidarity with us and his heart joined with ours. So if we start off with he co-suffers with us, Hebrews 4 verse 15 says the following, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. What a great verse. It first refers to Jesus as our high priest. Now, what we must understand is when we go through the Old Testament, we'll see there's two like, major figures. There's kings and, high, and priests. Kings and priests, kings and priests, the whole way. The, the king was there to represent God to the people. The priest was there to represent the people to God. The one had authority over the people. The other one had solidarity with the people. So we're talking about the priest here as the one who has solidarity with the people. He's the king as well. But in this verse, he's the priest. I'm with the people. Representing. Um, It says that he is able to sympathize. This isn't like a distant sympathy. You know, like, oh, too bad, sorry. I I think our understanding of that word sympathy is like a bit of a weak word. And, and, and almost like a distant, like, eh, sorry to hear, but actually, sorry, not sorry. Um, sympathize within the context of the original text means to suffer with, which is why I've got that co-suffer. He, he's not going through what you're going through now in the sense that he's going through that exact thing, but he experiences it as much as you experience it. He knows what it is that you're going through to suffer with. It's like if you think of a doctor who's providing treatment for a a disease that you've got to cure that disease. You know, sometimes you go to the doctor and you you just get treatment, you know. Other times you you can feel and sense there's a deeper sympathy and 10 to 1, it's because the doctors had that same disease. You understand? Like, uh, uh, that's different. It's like, I'm treating you now with a knowledge of what you're going through. But then we can take it one step further, and that doctor can be a family member. Because, you know, when you have a family member that's sick, you sick with them. Your heart is with them. Like, if your child is sick, it's like, they might be lying on the bed, but your heart is there on the bed with them. Do you get like, this is Jesus, the high priest, the great high priest that has replaced all the priests that's gone before. And it says he's tempted in every respect. Now that means 
in all aspects of life. You know, some people can say, yeah, but, you know, when I was in grade five, I gave that girl a Valentine's card and I got nothing back. There's no evidence of the fact that Jesus went through that experience, okay? So, when it says in every respect, it's like in all aspects of life, he's got all the bases covered as far as his experience of fallen humanity. So he came as a a man, as the son of God, he came as a man, a sinless man, but he didn't come as a sinless superman, where he, he couldn't feel the difficulty of humanity, the fallenness of this state. He felt it in its full context. He, he knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was to be thirsty. He, he experienced abandonment. He was scorned. He was shamed. He was embarrassed. He was falsely accused. He was tortured. He was killed. I mean, the list just goes on and on. If you're going to bring your life and say, well, I don't know if Jesus knows what I'm going through, don't, don't start that comparison. <laughs> Anyone here that's been through torture, physical torture, no? I know no one's been killed. <laughs> but we could peel that thing back and, and you'll realize, no, his, his experience of fallen humanity has gone way beyond mine. When it talks about him being tempted and, and tested, it's, it's beyond what we've ever experienced as far as temptation goes. You know, C.S. Lewis talks about a, a man walking against the wind, a strong wind, so strong that he can barely not walk against the wind anymore. And eventually there's a moment where he gives in and he lies down. And in lying down, he would never know what that temptation would feel like 10 minutes later because he lay, lay down then and there. And then he says, Jesus never lay down. He knew what that temptation was like up until that point where you lay down and beyond, he never lay down. He can sympathize. And in his sympathizing, because he has been tested every way, he joins himself to us in full solidarity and he co-suffers with us. He engages in our difficulty from his heart, even though he's in heaven. That's the flow of Jesus. The next point, he deals gently with us. So the text of Hebrews 4.15 talks about the what of Christ's priestly role. This verse of Hebrews 5.2 talks about the how, and the how is the following. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. This word gently, again looking at the original Greek, there's a a word, I'm not exactly sure of the pronunciation, but here goes anyway, metropathian. Made up of two words, metro, metrio, and pathio. So these two words come together. Metrio is a sense of restraint, a holding back. Pathio is a passion, a moving forward. It's like this combination of the two. But what it means in this context is he's got restraint when it comes to our sins. There he holds. He's He's got a calm. He's got a control. He's able to hold You know, for those who have kids, you will know what it's like to lose restraint. (laughs) Because the first time they cross the line, it's like, okay, but now listen, don't do that again. And then you're proud of yourself. I held it together. (laughs) The second time they cross the line, it's like, um... Okay, but did you hear the last time and the, and the voice moves to a next, the next level? And I told you then, don't do it again. And the third time they crossed the line, well, tickets. <laughs> Strike three. This metrio is, it doesn't matter how many times you cross the line, perfect restraint. <laughs> Yeah. 
So when it comes to our sin, that's how Jesus is. He's gentle in that way. He's restrained. Perfect calm. But when it comes to us, there's full compassion and beautiful tenderness that moves in our direction. So that's what this meaning of gentle is. He deals with us gently. You might ask the question, well, with whom does he deal gently? I'm assuming it's for those who have some form of moderate level of sin. And then for the more serious cases, you know, there's some other harsher treatment. No, it says to the ignorant and wayward, which is basically everyone. Everyone's in that uh, definition. Because in the Old Testament, there were two ways that you could sin. There was willful sin and unwillful. Deliberate and accidental. That's what it's referring to. Ignorant and wayward. So the, the writer of Hebrews knows he's speaking to Jews and they would understand what this means. Everyone. All sin. So he deals gently, metropathion, with everyone for all sins. So Jesus' tenderness is not linked to the severity of our sin. His tenderness is linked to us coming to him. Because when he says, come to me, that's an open invitation. You can either decide not to, or you can decide to. If you don't, what you face is fierce, lion-like judgment. So all this metropathy, it's for those who come to Jesus. When you come to him, you get deep, lamb-like tenderness. There's a distinction there. But we will all be enveloped by one of those two. Either fierce, lion-like judgment or deep, lamb-like tenderness. One of those two. Jesus will be neutral to no one. That's huge. And when he has lamb-like tenderness, it's not because he has a diluted view of sin. It's because he has metropathion. Because he has that gentleness of restraint towards our sin and tenderness towards us. There was a story of um, a man who met his old teacher, went to the teacher and said, do you remember me? I was in your grade six class. And the teacher kind of looked at him and he's like, yeah, yeah I, re I remember your face, yeah. He said, do you remember, you remember the day one of the boys' watch went missing? And the teacher kind of like, mm, not really. Tell me a little bit about that. He said, well, one of the boys' watches went missing. And the reason why it went missing is because I stole it. And uh, he said, yeah, and then? He said, well, don't, don't you remember? You, you said whoever's taken the watch, they must come forward and... You gave opportunity, but I was too embarrassed. I said nothing. And, and then what you did is you made us line up without anyone being able to leave the, the room. And, and you asked us all to close our eyes. And then you, you started on the one end and you went through the pockets of our blazers. And you went from one to the next. And then you came to me. And you put your hand in the pocket of my blazer and you took out the watch. But then you continue to go down the line. And you went through all the pockets. And you were able to give the watch back to that boy. But without anyone finding out that it was me. Don't you remember? 
You didn't say a word. You didn't even come and speak to me. Why did you do that? You know what the teacher said to him? I also had my eyes closed. You see, that's restraint when it comes to the wrong. I'm not going to go for the wrong. I'm not going to go for the thing that went out of place. I'm not going to, the sin is not the thing that I'm going for. I'm restrained in that. But when it comes to righting the wrong and getting the watch back to the rightful owner and restoring the dignity of the person who failed, that's where my tenderness will go. And that's exactly what Jesus does with us. He deals gently with us. He permanently embraces us. In John 6, verse 37, Jesus says the following, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Just a few things. It says all, not most, all. Whoever the Father sets his loving gaze on, all. Rescue is certain. Then it says the Father. What we must understand is when Jesus is the priest and he's mediating, it's not that the Father is angry and that the Son is trying to pacify the anger. There is something of a wrath that needs to be dealt with, but but it's the Father who lovingly initiates. So it's the Father that gives These are the people. These are my people. I want them to be saved. It comes from the Father. And then it says, will come. Whoever the Father sets his loving gaze on, they will come. Which means the saving purposes of the Father will never be thwarted. Thwarted is a very fancy word for prevented. Some of you might be saying that's what I thought. (laughs) then it says whoever so it's amazing how there's this certain rescue whoever the father like will come but then there's a whoever like we still have freedom of choice we have freedom of will we get to make a decision which means that there's still absolute dignity and authenticity in this relationship how those two things come together we don't have to figure out we just need to know that that's how it is And it says, comes to me, which we're not coming to a set of values. We're not coming to doctrines. We're not even coming to church. We're coming to a person. And then Jesus says, I will never cast out. So (laughs) there's always a, a challenge in terms of the jump from what was originally written to finding the right language to explain what was meant. But, but this is where, where Jesus uses things like, I, have, um, I will in no wise cast anyone out. There, there's ways to attempt to basically explain what Jesus is saying. But what it means is like a double, I will not, I repeat, not cast out. He is so strong in what he is saying and he is putting it across to us in such a way that we can have this assurance. But we need to believe it. We need to believe this promise that he says. And I think there could be reason and I think our hearts work in that way that we find reasons to not believe it or to be like, "Mm, I'd like to believe it but I'm not 100% sure. And and there's two reasons for that. The one is sin in our lives, and the other one is suffering in our lives. So when sin comes into our lives, we have that difficulty to believe that, yeah, but geez, I did this, and there was that. What about this? And when Jesus says, I will not cast out, I mean, I've come to him, but I'm I'm just not 100% sure. You know, the Bible speaks that there, about the fact that there is only one sin that cannot be pardoned, and that's blasphemy towards the Holy Spirit. What that means is that when Jesus says, come to me, that becomes something that we are hearing and being aware of and awakened to, 
and yet given the faith to respond to and actually come to Jesus. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. So the sin that is unpardonable is not responding to that work of the Holy Spirit. That's the only sin, which obviously makes sense because you haven't come to Jesus, so you find yourself in the other category where you're not in Christ. But apart from that, there is not a sin that can keep you away from him. And then if you think of suffering, you know, that starts to test and question the perseverance of Christ's heart towards me. Because if the suffering continues... And if there's pain attached to that suffering and the pain is mounding and it's like month after month or year after year and there's a difficulty in you trying to make sense of this and you start to wonder, am I still in that space? Or have I been cast out? Like when Jesus says, I'll never cast out, but why am I suffering like this? We need to realize that Jesus didn't say to the one who has a pain-free life, I will not cast out. Says, whoever comes to me, that's the qualifier. A, a, a life of pain and suffering is not like us saying, mm, I'm not so sure that this is how Jesus feels about me. His heart is still with us. There is deep solidarity. I mean, when I, like with, with kids growing up and going through that toddler phase, we, we were living in Pretoria for all three of our kids' as toddler phase, okay? So when we went to the beach, it was always on holiday, and they were unfamiliar with this very big sand pit and large pool that moves. And the boys would kind of just run straight in and, and then realize, okay, this thing's bigger than me. Rosie had a different approach. As a girl, she wanted to walk in with me. So we would walk in, and it would just be our feet, and then it would kind of just hit over the ankles, well, mine, and uh, for hers it was getting a little bit deeper, a little bit quicker. But she didn't put her foot in that water without clinging onto my hand. And I realized that as we got deeper and as the waves became a little bit more prominent, her cling became a little bit tighter. But I also realized that there's a point where her clinging to my hand is not going to be strong enough. Amid the waves, like the the strength of that, the movement of that, she's not going to be able to hold on. And so the actual kind of holding shifted from her holding on to me to me holding on to her. And what I said in my mind is that I'm determined to not let her go because the last thing I want is for her to have a bad experience in the waves and it's going to have an impact on her and obviously I don't want her to get hurt. And so my grip became this rock solid, sure, and because I determined in my mind and determined in my heart that I would not let her go, there was nothing that would get her out of my hand. Do you realize that as we move through the storms and the waves of this life, if we understand the heart of Jesus, we will realize that while we are trying to cling to him, he realizes way more than we do the need for him to hold on to us. And he never lets go. We have permanent residence in his heart. We're not a tenant renting. Wondering, are we ever going to get notice? We're a permanent resident. More than that, we're a child. And that's where we belong. And his embrace towards us is permanent. Then, second lastly, it says he sides with us. Now, you'll notice every one of those phrases, there's an us. And I have touched on it, but I want to say it again. There is a distinction between those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. So when we're talking about the heart of Jesus, we are referring to the 
those who are in Christ. That's his heart towards those of us who are children of God, who have this beautiful redemption. So for those who are not in Christ, when it comes to our sin, or their sin, if I could put it that way, that evokes holy wrath. When it comes to our sin and the sins of those who are in Christ, it evokes a longing, a tenderness, a heart for, a desire to defend, to help. I mean, can can we understand that there's that distinction? Because we can't hear about the wrath of God and his feelings towards sin and then think, okay, well, my sins are forgiven, but mm, every now and again, like, do I maybe straddle onto that line? We're like, how's, how's God feeling towards me? Is, is he like bitterly disappointed? And is he like angry because I've done that? There's a separation that happens. And when that separation happens, the sheep and the goats, or whatever you want to call it, there's, there's those who are in Christ and those who are not. The sins of this evokes holy wrath. The sins of those who are in Christ, it evokes a longing and a desperate compassion and tenderness towards us. He sides with us. You know, John writes, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So the whole context of that is we're not promoting sin. We're not talking about sin and and Jesus' heart towards you in a way where you get given license. Sin is still sin. There's a problem there. So he's, he's saying, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. <laughs> what a great... An advocate. We have a defender. We have a champion. And in this mediating work, it's not the Father and us and Jesus in the middle mediating. It's the Father and us and Jesus standing next to us. I'm the advocate here. I'm defending. I'm the champion. I will stand by you. I'm going to come alongside you. I'll defend your cause. In Hosea 11, there's um, such an amazing couple of verses. In verse 11, it says, My people are bent on turning away from me. So God's saying, my people, those who are in Christ, those who are saved, they're still bent on turning away from me. And then he says, how can I give you up? Or hand you over, O Israel? How can I treat you like Adma and Zeboam, which is cities that were destroyed? Then it says in verse 8, my heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. You see, we hear sin and holiness of God, and what we'd actually expect to read is, I will therefore come in wrath. That doesn't say that. That says, I will not come in wrath, because we're talking about my people. Those who are under the covering of this redeeming love, the blood that has been spilt. If you come under that and you are part of the people of God, you're a child of God, when all of this is going down, even though I'm holy, even though I'm in your midst as the Holy One and you've bent on turning away from me, I will not come in wrath. I won't. My heart is for you. I side with you. You know, reconciling these things is hard, but if you think about a pure heart, if you have a pure heart, evil in the world is an issue for you. Like you, you notice it. It's, it's, it's obvious and, and, and like there's a cringe factor or there's a, uh, like an, an uneasy, but as much as a pure heart has that feeling towards sin and evil, a corrupt heart is kind of indifferent. 
Eh, it's not a biggie. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. It's just sex before marriage. What is she? But when you have a purity of heart and you understand something of God's purity, those things cut in and it's like, ah. Okay, so we understand that distinction. But the pure in heart who has that response to evil is the same heart. The fact that that purity is there draws you towards where you see those things and you want to bring help and relieve and comfort. Whereas the corrupt heart is indifferent in terms of what it means and indifferent as far as, nah, I don't need to do anything about that. So you see how a pure heart has that feeling towards sin, but it also has the drawn to because I want to help and I want to sort and I want to try and fix and bring comfort in this space. That's exactly what's happening in Jesus' heart. His holiness finds evil revolting. But it's that same holiness that brings out of his heart a drawnness to fix the fallenness of this humanity. When um, Mark tore his uh, ACL in his knee, as a father, I had hostility in me towards the injury. Like, not towards the ligament, why did you tear? But towards like the cause of it. Like, you know, was it was there proper conditioning before they went straight onto that rugby field out of a like however many months of being in lockdown and um now there's a consequence to this and he's gonna miss his season next year and there's all these things that comes with it and the costs attached to it, all of that hostility. Like a, a feeling towards like ah. But my love for him wasn't compromised at all. In fact, I felt like my heart draw closer to him because of what he was going through. Do you understand what's happening when, when Jesus sees the injury in our hearts, the injury in our lives, the fractured elements, the brokenness? That's how he feels. There's hostility towards the sin, but towards us, tenderness. I want to sort this out. And you might say, well, what about the discipline of God? I mean, Hebrews 12, let's bring that into the conversation. That's not punishment. I mean, his knee needed surgery. They they needed, like, therapy after the surgery, ongoing rehabilitation. That's not punitive. That's to help. That's for the future of his leg. That's so that he can actually walk properly and play sport again. It's not punitive. It's helpful. That's exactly what Jesus does. Want to restore. Sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it takes long times. But, but he works towards our restoration because that's his heart for us. <sighs> Lastly, he continues his work for us. Hebrews seven twenty five says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, the reason that we know that he will save us to the uttermost is because of the heavenly intercession of Jesus. To understand intercession, we've got to actually first talk about our justification, which is our right standing with God. The fact that our sins have been forgiven and we've been given a righteousness that's not of our own. That's the atoning work that Jesus accomplished, and it's something that he did when he was on earth. It's his past work. Someone uh, wrote in, in one of the things that I read this week, intercession, the intercession of Jesus, is like Jesus pushing the refresh button on that atoning work on an ongoing basis in heaven. I love that as an analogy. Refresh, 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 refresh. What's Jesus doing right now? Refresh, 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 
refresh. That's what he's doing right now. He's praying for us. He's interceding for us. You see, when we think of justification on its own, it's very easy for it to become a formula. Like we think of it as that's what Jesus did, and so that's what it means for me, and I'm saved. And, and if it's only that, then he becomes a functional savior. But when we think about what he's doing right now, when we realize that he's appropriating that atoning work to our lives all the time, then he becomes a personal savior. He's personal. He's, he's always appropriating this beautiful work of redemption to our lives. There's a, a um, case in Luke 13. It's the only other place where this word uttermost, in terms of the original language, um, comes up. And you know what it means? Standing up straight all the way. And, and that Luke 13 account is of a, a disabled lady who was bent over. So that's the image. He saves us so that we stand up all the way. Saves us to the uttermost. I think very often we have salvation, which means we've been healed of our disability, but we still walk like this. Because we don't live in the fullness of the fact that Jesus' work is not just this historic thing that when I die, I go to heaven. He's constantly refreshing and appropriating this beautiful work to my life. And when I understand that as a revelation, I start to walk up, standing straight all the way because he saves us to the uttermost. You might ask, well, why is that necessary? Does that mean that the work of the cross is incomplete, that there's almost an ongoing work? No, it just means that there was a work that was done, and Jesus said it is finished. It's a completed work. But because of his heart towards us, because of his affections, he's constantly just appropriating that in the courtrooms of heaven. He doesn't sit on the rock right hand of God and just sit there. He's constantly interceding. And, and because of his heart for us, he's appropriating this work. So if you think of a, a, a let's say a younger brother is participating in a 800 meter and the older brother is on the side of the field and, and lap one, lap two, halfway through, it's 200 meters to go, and it is obvious that the younger brother is going to take this. He's miles ahead of the guy that's coming second. Victory has been secured. The outcome of this race has been established. Does the older brother, at that point of realizing it, stop yelling from the side and cheering his brother on? Does he say, okay, well, pretty much I'm just going to go sit down here. Mm, good. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here quietly, wait for the end of the race, just with like complacent satisfaction. Yeah, he won. Oh, he keeps yelling. He keeps cheering on the side. Exclamations of celebration. Go, Boyke. Go, go. He does it all the way till the end of the race. He doesn't stop. Nothing can keep him quiet. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. Because victory has been established. The outcome of this race, we know. We can read about it in Revelation. But he doesn't sit down and quietly sit back with a complacent attitude. He's along the sidelines. And he's shouting over us with great exclamation. You are cleansed. You are forgiven. You are ransomed. You are redeemed. You're adopted. And the Father's responding with a yes, yes, yes. What a work of intercession that's taking place right now. You see, I don't want a functional savior. Where I live my life in a way, it was like, ah, whatever. As long as I go to heaven when I'm done, I want to live with the uttermost salvation that's just going through every part of who I am as a person. I stand up straight because of this revelation of a work that is ongoing. He continues to intercede for us. He never ceases.